When we look into the Word of God, there are many things that we can see. Well, maybe we don't see. Let me ask this question. Are you an individual today that has problems seeing? Miss Jessica mentioned about the see in the back here, uh, being able to read the words that is listed are up there for us, and sometimes it is difficult to see them. But do you have problems seeing? Did you know there are a lot of people who have difficulty seeing? And there are all types of things that people can get done in order to see better. Some of you are aware of them. Number one is the area of glasses. How many of you wear glasses? Or maybe you don't wear glasses. You don't want people to look at you wearing glasses, so you use what they call as contacts. Anybody in here wear contacts? Okay, we got a few people who wear contacts. You know, it looks, well, hey, listen, it doesn't matter. That is to cause you to see clearer. True, right? Nobody buys glasses or pays for the glasses in order to see worse. You buy the glasses in order to see better. And also, you, you can have what they call surgery nowadays. The cataract surgery that is going on, that is helping to uh, eliminate some of the blurriness that you might have. And, and listen, I'll admit I'm guilty. I'll go into a restaurant and I look at the menu and I'm like, there's writing down here? I have to pull out my phone, and you know what I got to do? Is I have to turn on the flashlight. And they say that that's signs of possibly needing surgery, uh, you know, whatever it is. But it, it, there's so much that we begin and we take for granted in the area of sight. Imagine with me just for a moment what your life would be like if you no longer was able to see. Try it for a little bit. Try to make your rounds, make your way uh, without the ability to see. And yet many individuals are going through life and they have the inability to see what God sees. We are living in a generation who have extreme difficulty seeing the signs all around them. Is God trying to get our attention? The answer to that is yes. More so than ever before, we see the signs of God that is trying to get people to finally take note and see what God wants them to see. But yet the people are still unable to see the signs around them. And I'm not talking about the road signs that God is wanting us to see, but I'm talking about the signs that, that uh, God is wanting you to draw closer to Him. Because there is nothing that this world offers us that is worthwhile. But what God offers us is eternal. The things of this world are temporary. And so when we turn and look to God, we begin to have this sense of a desire. Are we living in a culture that is so spiritually blind and yet we are following in their blindness? Are we individuals who are able to see? So I ask this and I state it this way. Uh, God wants you to see clearly, but do we? God wants us to see clearly. God wants us to understand the outcome of your life. God wants you to understand there is something beyond the grave. God wants you to realize the fundamental truths, and yet people are not able to see it. So God wants us to see clearly, but do we? And now this is a very personal question because you can only answer for you. And so I ask you to answer it. Do you see clearly what God wants you to see? Are you seeing anything that God is trying to convey to you in your life? So when we look at this, we begin to realize that there are several passages of Scripture. We've been talking about seeing what God sees 
for the last several Sundays. When we look at this concept, I want to go into the area of the problem with what we see. Now, there's two passages of Scripture we're going to get to. Mark chapter 10, so you can mark that in your Bible. And John chapter 9, we're going to start there in our Bibles. And I want you to turn there because in this passage of Scripture, we begin to see the truths of God's Word being revealed to us. And this is the problem that we have the problem of what we see. Now, John chapter 9 is a good illustration to us of what is going on. In John chapter 9, we find that Jesus has just done a wonderful work in the life of an individual, and we begin to see how Jesus is dealing and Jesus is, is uh, combating not only the lost people, but he's also targeting the religious people. People who should have good vision. People who should see clearly what God has for them to obey and to follow. But in John chapter 9, beginning with verse 39, this is what we began to see. Jesus is dealing with the religious. And Jesus said, he says, For judgment I am come into this world that they which see, see not, might see. So God has come into this world, Christ has come into this world to bring sight to you. God is wanting you to see clearly. And then he goes on to say, and they that which see might be made blind. Now, what he is talking about is there are those individuals who say they see clearly, but yet they're as blind as a bat. They have no ability to see, and yet they are leading many people astray. That is happening throughout the Christian community because Christians ought to really be able to see what God wants them to see. But yet they're leading people away from God and they're causing people to stay out of church when they ought to be influencing people to be in church. So here's what uh, happens. Some of the Pharisees, now the Pharisees are the devoutest of devout Christians of that day, are followers of God. They were well versed in what the Old Testament had to say. And so when the Pharisees hear, hears this word, some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and they said unto him, Are we blind also? He says, Are we are we blind? And many today in our life would be saying that, are we blind? And yet the reality is, by your lifestyle. You say you see, but in reality, you're blind because you're making no changes in the area of following him. So here's what he, what he says. Jesus says, verse 41, Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. Okay, understand what he's saying. If you're blind, you'd have no sin. But he goes on, but now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. What he is establishing here is that these individuals have come to the realization that they, they know it better than anybody else. And therefore, they're saying, well, we see the truth, we're following the truth, but they're blind to the reality of who Jesus Christ is. The Pharisees were part of the group that was against Jesus Christ. So the problem with what we see is basically three things that I jotted down. First and foremost, we are individuals. We see only what we want to see. Amen? Think about that. You, in your life, you see only the things you want to see. Now, let me say it this way. If you want to see evil, bad things, you'll see them all around you. It's your perception of what you want to see, you will begin to focus upon, and you'll always look for the evil, the bad. There is bad in our society. There is a lot of bad things happening, but you can also be in the area of, of, of seeing the good. Now, that's not often what we're doing. We're seeing the bad. We, we major on the bad, how horrible the things are around us, which they are. But I assure you that as bad as things are in our generation today, they aren't near as bad as they were in the days of Noah. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, what did God do? God destroyed the whole world because of the wickedness and the imagination of the minds of individuals was bent on evil all the time. Now, there's good things going on, but it depends on what you want to see. 
Well, what do we want to see? The problem with what we want to see is not only do we see what we want to see, but we also, we look at other people and we see their sins. We see the sins of other people. We see how uh, these other people fall into the category of being sinners. Well, they're the sinner. And we begin to point out every flaw and every sin that they commit. Well, if they was really serving God, this is how they would begin to act. These are the things that they ought to be doing. If I was them, this is how I would resolve the issue. And we begin to confront it in the area of where looking at other individuals. We are not, listen people, we are not to be focused upon others as much as we are to be focused upon ourselves. And that brings us to number three, is the area that we fail to see our own sins. People, let me say this. The next time that devil, that bug, comes to you and wants you to point out the sins in somebody else's life, you need to stop and start jotting down the sins in your own life. Amen? You need to get your eyes off of them and get your eyes upon Christ and ask Christ to rid you of the things in your own life because when we're rid of the things in our own lives, we'll begin to see with the things that God is wanting us to see. We need to deal with me. I cannot, here's the thing, I cannot change anybody other than myself. So why am I spending all this time looking at everybody else's shortcomings and I'm not doing anything about mine. God is trying to get us to take a focused look upon us and begin to deal with the sin in our own lives and and to make things become better in our own lives. So that's the problem with what we see. We don't see things clearly. There's a lot of bad-sightedness in our own lives. And when you deal with that, we need to step back because the whole message is seeing what God sees. So what is it that God sees? When we look at what God sees, we begin to realize that God sees several things. First of all, he sees us as a sinner in need of salvation. Now we can talk about passages of scripture throughout the New Testament. John chapter 3 where he he knows that uh, we're already condemned. It isn't that Jesus came and he says, oh, you're condemned. No, you're condemned already because of sin in your life. And we know that that is a reality that if we receive Jesus Christ, we have moved from condemnation to eternal life. And so he sees us as individuals who are in need of salvation. We can go over into the book of Romans and we can realize that the wages of sin is death. But... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So what God does, when God looks at us as individuals, he sees a person, a man or woman, young or old, matters not, that we are individuals who are sinners in need of a Savior. Amen. That's what the angel uh, pronounced about the birth of Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of mankind. And so when we realize this, we have an understanding that what God begins to see is he sees a sinner in need of salvation. God sees me as a sinner in need of salvation. Secondly, what God sees is God always knows the direction of your life. That is, he sees the direction that you're heading in. Did you know that God sees everything? Did you know that God knows the intent of your mind before you act upon it? Did you know that the direction that you are about to head in, God is aware that it is a good direction or a bad direction? And many times we already know ahead of time whether it's a good direction or a bad direction. We begin to question Uh, Should I do this? And a lot of times when we begin to question whether or not we should do something, the truth is typically we shouldn't do it because we're trying to justify within our own minds. And we're trying to say, okay, it's okay. Other people are doing it. That's a big mistake. Gauging your walk with God by looking at somebody else. People, God speaks to you as an individual. 
And God wants us to listen to him. So the directions that you are going to, are you going towards him? Are you going away from him? That's what God knows. God knows if the decisions you're about to make is leading you closer to him or further away from him. You see, God sees this. Before you even act upon it, God begins to see the direction that you're headed in. But then also, number three in the area of what God sees is God sees the motives, our motives, behind everything that we do. Did you know that we can deceive a lot of people? Remember when Jesus was there and, and the, the money was being given to the offering of the temple and how all these individuals come in and they just bring in this large amount of money and they pop it down and they put it there and, and it's just so great the amount that was given and here comes this little widow and she comes there and she gives just a teeny bit of all that she had, of what she needed and she gives it. And Jesus marveled and commented about her gift because her motives were pure. And the motives of the others were, well, if I give large amounts, then everybody's going to think how good a Christian I am. People, it's not the dollar sign that you're given, but it's the heart sign. The amount that you give from the heart is what Jesus, and, and, and he is aware of it. He's aware of your motives. Why did you do what you did? Well, I did it in order for them to owe me and to do back for me some other time. That's the wrong motives. So what God sees is he sees the legitimate motives behind what you're doing. Why are you in church today? I hope it's to serve and to worship the Lord. You see, he knows the motives. I came just because it's, well, I had nowhere else better to go. Well, that's the wrong motive. Do you understand what I'm saying? God sees our motives. And if our motives are wrong, then we need to get back into the path of where we see what God is, is wanting us to see and we make some changes. So our motives. But not only does God know about our motives, but God knows about our future. Number four in the area. What God sees is he sees our future. God sees my future already before it's happened. Now, I'm talking about eternal future. God knows where I am going to spend eternity. Because my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. So my future, the ultimate future, is way out there and I will be spending it with Christ in heaven. But not everybody can say that. Some individuals find that their future is not going to be heaven. They will say things like, well, I hope I'm going to get to heaven. Why don't you know? Well, nobody can know for sure. That's not what the word of God says. The Bible tells us that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. We can get rid of all the doubt and we can know for certain that we're going to spend eternity with him because it's not upon believing on what we have done and the accomplishments of ourselves, but believing upon what Jesus Christ has done. So he, God, knows our future. He knows, he knows today whether you're going to be in heaven or hell. He knows that. And then what else we realize, what God sees, is God sees the good in you. Now, we often don't realize this. God has that ability to see the good about me before I see the good about me. And often before other people see the good about me. A lot of people look at you right now and they say, whoa, that's a terrible person. Look how evil they are. What did people say about Paul? Before he met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. He was a persecutor of believers in Jesus Christ. He had letters from the religious establishment to have Christians persecuted. And brought back for death. And yet when God got a hold of him, something happened. You see, God saw the good in him before other people and even before Paul saw the good in himself. So God sees the good in you. God knows the good that you're capable of. God knows what you can become. God knows what you are, but yet he knows what you can become. So Mark chapter 10 brings us into the next category. What God does to help us in order to see. 
And this is a story in regards to us in, in Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 46 through verse 52. This is an individual who is a lit a legitimately unable to see. He's blind, physically blind. He has no sight. And the only livelihood he had was there to be a beggar. And we find that in Mark chapter 10, uh, beginning with verse 46, that the opportunity came for something to happen. Then came uh, verse 46, and they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. That is his livelihood. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him and said to him, hold your peace. But yet he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he cast in away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What will thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus in the way. Now, what happens here is a case of an individual and what we need to realize that what God does to help us see is this. Number one, God gives you opportunities to see what he wants you to see. Now, the opportunity of blind Bartimaeus is that here Jesus is on journey and he's coming into the vicinity where blind Bartimaeus is. And when the opportunity comes and God is speaking to your heart or God is passing by and you see the power of God dealing in the lives of individuals in the life of the church, you ought to cease that opportunity. You ought to begin to reach out and, and lay claims upon what God is doing. God gives us opportunities to begin to see clearly. And a lot of times we just ignore it. And we let it pass by. But when God has given us the opportunity, you need to move into the next aspect of what God does to help us to see is he, he, that is God, makes us aware of his love. Now, how did blind Bartimaeus know about the love of Jesus Christ? He had to know about the love of Jesus Christ. If he didn't know about the love of Jesus Christ, why in the world would he be calling out to this man who's coming into town? He'd just be an ordinary individual. But yet there was something that blind Bartimaeus knew about this Jesus that was different than anybody else. He knew that Jesus loved people. Jesus loved sinners like him, like us. So when he, he, Jesus is making him aware, he heard of the love of Jesus, he heard of the miracles of Jesus, and yet he was unable to travel to Jesus, but he hears that Jesus is coming by. And we know that what God, God does to help us to see is that God will save us from our sins. That is, number three, God reaches us and he saves us. We don't save ourselves, he saves us. The song we sing, I was sinking deep in sin. That's it. I was sinking. And it's Jesus Christ who restores us back into the fellowship of be, being saved. So he saves us from our sin. What Jesus did, the Bible says that Jesus come to seek and to save that which was lost. And blind Bartimaeus not only was physically blind, but he was spiritually blind. And he needed a touch of Jesus Christ, the love of God that changed his life and made him an individual that saw spiritually, but also saw physically. What we need is people who say they see physically, see spiritually. 
So not only does that happen, when we go into the area, not only does he save us from our sins, but he fills us with his presence. Now this is what I like. When you get saved, one of the greatest things that what God does to help us to see is that he fills us with the presence of the Holy Spirit. People, there are a lot of people who have read their Bibles. They have read a Bible. They have read through the Bible. And they find that the Bible, they don't understand the Bible. And the reason they don't understand is something's lacking. They don't have the right set of glasses in order to see what the Word of God has to say. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about physical glasses. I'm talking about the spiritual glasses. The Holy Spirit. You cannot understand the Word of God without the help of the Holy Spirit. There is a need for us to have the Spirit, and so He fills us with His presence. He promised the Holy Spirit after He ascended, and the Holy Spirit filled the lives of the believers, and things began to change. So He fills us with His presence. This is what God does to help us see. Fills us with His presence. You see, before He's trying to, to bring about awareness of sin and to, to bring salvation to us, but once you're saved, He gives you the Holy Spirit that allows you to be able to uh, obey and to follow and to serve Him and to read the Word of God and begin to say, He's talking about me. And how personal it becomes that God loves us. <clears throat> And then when we go to the fifth thing in the area of what God does to help us see is that he uses us. And, and this is what is so amazing. God uses us in order to help others. God didn't save you for no purpose. God saved you for the purpose of reaching others, of helping others. You see, he wants you, a blind individual who has now received spiritual sight, to take somebody, the message of Jesus Christ, who is spiritually blind, who needs the sight, and he wants you to help them to see as clearly as you see about the love of God. When you begin to see the love of God, you realize that God is using you. Now, there's a, a, a portion of this passage that we read, and often we fail to realize or, or focus upon it. There in verse 52, we, we begin to see. Jesus said to the individual, blind Bartimaeus, he says, Go thy way. Thy faith had made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight. But notice the next part. And followed Jesus in the way. Now, we fail to realize that one of the names that was given to the followers of Jesus Christ was those who are of the way, the way of Jesus. That is, they are changed individuals. They are individuals who now see fully. And this is what Christ is beginning to say and, and to do with them. Because Jesus asked him, well, what do you want done? He says, I want to see and when Jesus gave him the physical sight, he also gave him the spiritual sight. That blind Bartimaeus says, I don't want to go back to what I once was because what I got now is better. Amen? You get what I'm saying? You see, what you have now in Jesus Christ is far better than what you've had in the past. What you have now will last for all eternity. What you had in the past doesn't. And so we come into that realization that he is using us to help other individuals. So let me go into the, the final aspect. How we as individuals should respond. Seeing what is happening in these verses, we began to realize that religious individuals, they say they see, but they're not seeing. Because if they were seeing, they would be receptive to Jesus Christ. They would be following Jesus Christ. They would be promoting Jesus Christ. But they were anti-Jesus Christ. They were against Jesus Christ. And so when you get to the concept of blind Bartimaeus, who was an individual who once he saw, once he began to see clearly, he was an individual who says, I'm going to follow Jesus' way. I'm going to follow the way of Jesus Christ. So how should we respond? Look with me there in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 47 and verse 48. This is the first thing that we need to do. We need to cry out to Jesus. Look what happens. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. 
He says, Jesus is coming. And I'm going to make myself known. I'm going to speak out. I'm going to uh, just proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David. Now, what does he cry out and say? What he says is, have mercy on me. Now, let me say this. Any individual who calls out and asks God for his mercy with their heart sincere receives God's mercy. I can attest to that. You can attest to that. But when we look at the rest of this, go with me down to verse 48. Now, many of the individuals who are around him said to him, hey, he don't have time for you. I'm paraphrasing. He don't have any time for you. You're one individual. Jesus is on mission. Jesus has something else he needs to do that's more important to you. People, listen, there is nothing more important to Jesus than you. And when he, he hears you cry out and began to say, have mercy on me, Jesus stops. Because the Bible begins to establish there in verse 49, Jesus stood still. Stood still. And what we find is the people are trying to stop him from crying out. They said, don't cry out. And what this individual did, he says, I'm not going to listen to you because you don't know what it's like to be blind. You can see, but yet you don't see that Jesus is the answer that I need. If you saw that Jesus was the answer that I need, you would be taking me to Jesus. Get the picture? What are they doing? Keeping the message to themselves. We need Jesus. You don't. We're, you know, Jesus don't have time for you. But verse 49 says Jesus has time for anyone who is seeking to him. They said unto him in verse 49, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. Isn't that great? He calls thee. So we need to cry out. We need to cry out to Jesus. Not only do we need to cry out to Jesus, but there's a second aspect. We need to allow Christ to change you. Now, blind Bartimaeus didn't receive his sight yet. He cried out to Jesus. He cried out to Jesus. Jesus acknowledged him. And here's what we find in verse 51. Jesus answered and said unto him, Hey, blind Bartimaeus, what is it that you want me to do for you? Now, people, listen. Jesus knew this guy was blind. But why did Jesus ask that? Because Jesus does only what we ask him to do. In the life of cleansing us from sin, we come to him and say, Lord, here am I. Cleanse me of the sin in my life. Allow me to be made new. And when this individual acknowledged and says, Lord, that I might receive my sight, what happened? Jesus granted his wish. Because his heart was sincere. And the, the, you see it, how we should respond, cry out to Jesus, and then we need to allow Christ to change us. To change us as individuals. There's a saying that goes like this. Do you see because you believe, or do you believe because you see? You ever heard that? Well, if you didn't, you've heard it now. How about that? I'll repeat it. Do you seek because you believe? Or do you believe because you see? Now some of you are trying to figure that equation out. Well, let me share with you. I believe Jesus died for me, therefore I see. I see what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, therefore I believe. So it is a two-for question that is answered in the area of yes. It is I see because I believe and I believe because I see. The concept of what Jesus Christ has done for me and what Christ has done for you is the opportunity of us to be born again. And it is my prayer. It is my prayer that I see what God sees. I want my sight 
to take second to what God wants me to see. What does God want you to see? Are you seeing what God wants you to see? That's the question. Seeing what God sees, it's needed in our culture. Because we need to see the potential of other individuals. We also need to see the potential that God has for us. And we need to step out in faith and say, God, God, if, if you can use me, a broken down individual like I am, then God, here am I, just use me to bring honor and glory to you. And I guarantee if, he, if your motives are pure, he will use you in a powerful way. But it begins with us saying, Lord, give me my sight. Give me the sight that I need to have. Pray with me.